Thank you, and thank you all for, for coming. I hope to make this um, fun for everybody here. So just first of all, like we are from a company called Altin. We've been in the VR uh, entertainment space for 10 years now. So we jumped in like really early when Oculus was getting started and all. And uh, one key reason for choosing VR for us was that we had a background in AI and characters. And to me, like when, when I was a kid, my brother was at MIT. And at, at one point I went to, um, uh, I went to visit him there. They, he had this demo and this was like in the 90s, it was heavy equipment had to wear gloves and they were like clunky and with wires all over the place. But what it let me do when I was 10, it let me point at a screen and say, put a mouse there, put a teapot here, turn it this way. And so I saw all these things appear on the screen and, and you know, move the mouse that way and the mouse moved. And, and ever since then, Computing interfaces to me have felt archaic. The mouse, the keyboard, and everything. Like, at that point, for me, it was like, this is how computers should work. Why can't this work like this today? I can make games this way. Like, and, and then I went back to the home computer, and the home computer had stuff I had no idea how to work. And so that's sort of an intro to how the interface can make computing more accessible and also enable these new types of experiences now with the advent of AI that's becoming more powerful. Uh, before I go any further, I know all of you know what VR and AR is, but I'm gonna just address how I'm going to approach it. Uh, we, we see VR and AR as the same thing, just two ends of the same spectrum. In both cases, you are interacting with a reality, but it's just a matter of how much of physical reality is there versus virtual. So that's our mindset, how we approach it, and, and whether you call it mixed reality or spatial computing, that's how I'm going to use these terms. It's a, an umbrella term for both. <clears throat> but yeah, the, going back to that example of like, um, how you can naturally interact with these interfaces, ever since we started making games or, or software overall, the idea has always been that it's like another reality. And you know, if you look back at like the original Apple uh, GUI design documents and you know, the manuals that came from people, they described it as a room in a house with files and folders. And we've been emulating this sort of reality in, uh, in computers for a long time. And for games, you know, it was never that you know, a mouse or a joystick or a keyboard was the ultimate thing and we wanted that. We never wanted that. We wanted things that were as close to reality simulations as possible. And you know, the mouse and the keyboard and the gamepad and everything was just the best we could do until now. And now we are moving into this phase where you know, we've had all of, this, all of these different uh, things over decades, but we're finally hitting the point that we always wanted, which is a fully interactive simulation. And whether you call it a holodeck experience or, or virtual reality experience or whatever, that's what we're describing. It's, it's where there is, you know, we, where we move away from the abstractions that mice and keyboard and joysticks have given us so far. And so, you know, it's not about seeing things. It's not about like being in a fully immersive environment and still being able to press all these buttons. It's not about that. It's about the natural interaction part of it, interacting as if it's real. And the interface is unabstracted. And what that means is that all of this, all of us is virtualized as well. We're not there yet. But we're getting there. We're, we are starting to get all our fully fledged finger movements in there. We're starting to get the upper body tracked while we're in, we're in VR AR. We're starting to get the spatial mapping of the world around us and our facial expressions and our eyes. That is a key thing that's often lost in discussions about VR and AR. 
It's always about the virtual environment. Now, think a little bit about what that means, that we are getting virtualized and transported in there. What that means is that finally, AI doesn't have to see us as just 2D coordinates that we're moving around with a mouse and a few button presses. That is crucial data that's held AI back for decades. You know, we've been trying to create these like photorealistic characters or whatever it is on a 2D screen, interacting with them with barely any data at all for them to react like a human would. Because what are they going to react to? The mouse movement? Like a little bit of our voice? It's, it doesn't work. When we are interacting with each other, there's uh, so much data that we're reacting to. Like there's, there's all these micro expressions, there are like the movements of our hands, it's the speed of them, it's the like, just the general thing that this interface is enabling is profound, but we have to tap into it. And like the discussions today haven't quite reached this point where we're talking about this, we're, we're still just kind of struggling with just making a virtual world and you know, this is a bit like for tomorrow. But today this is becoming possible now, especially with the latest advances in AI. And I'm going to show you an example a bit later. And so yeah, the data involved in all of this and the interface itself is a crucial component in accelerating AI advances. It's not just that AI can help make better virtual worlds, no. It's also the other way around. VR and AR can make AI infinitely more powerful and, and infinitely more human to interact with. So this presence data is a new frontier and that can be, you know, converted into information that AIs can understand. And it can be converted into, you know, new modes of interacting that even a 10 year old can use without having to learn anything. Just being able to point and say, make that bigger or make that explode. That's the type of computing I think that we've always wanted. We, we've never wanted to learn anything about how to use a computer. That's just something we suffer because it's a useful thing. And for, to me, like this, this um, may be cliche, this, this uh, quote, but it, that is what it feels like. Like that is what this type of interface does. It makes computing and software indistinguishable from magic. It's the interface that makes us able to do things like say, you know, when I snap my fingers, make that happen. And then you actually snap your fingers and it happens. It's like the, the movie magic, like it's like something out of Harry Potter. And so that brings us to like what Alden has been focusing on from day one. It's been interacting, natural interaction with characters and it's been an inter interactive simulation of a reality. Like we're, we don't exactly describe us as a gaming company. We're trying to unlock these new types of experiences that feel real. And just to give you one video example of, uh, these are just our latest prototypes in AR, uh, where we've been taking some of, the, some of the features that we have in Walls of the Wizards and doing them in like bringing magic to reality. But yeah, the, you will see hand gestures, you will see some of the things that I've, I've been describing, and so just jump right into that. So, what you saw there was just an example of, um, I think the voice was a little bit off, but effectively he's giving voice commands, which is um, something like, uh, when I snap my fingers, create a ball. And that happens when you snap your fingers. And that's gesture recognition going on. And it's sort of, you can create all of these different types of objects and things. And just to emphasize, like the interface here is perhaps the most important thing about VR and AR. Um, 
the ability to see things in your world or see things in a virtual world as if it's a reality is sort of um, just a prerequisite of having this interface. But the interface is the thing. And that can be turned into things that you know, can be used to train AI, it can be used to enable these interfaces, it can, and over time, it, it will definitely keep evolving and, and we will see these different types of modalities converge, like using this multimodal type of data where it's your voice, it's your hands, it's your eyes, it's your facial expressions, all of that working together is a key with this interface. As opposed to, like, up until now, it's been about having, yeah, we have this mouse which moves and we have buttons. So that's just a really limited um, interface compared to something like this. And um, this also, like I've been saying, enables characters to react to that. And that's another part of Walls of the Wizard which we've been working on. And right now, with the generative AI models that we have, it's possible to take all of this data and turn it into data that a, multi that a generative AI model understands. So basically, we can take all of this gestures, all of the gestures, all of the speed of hand movements, uh, where your eyes are looking, your expressions and everything, and describe it to a generative AI. And so that it can get that information that a human would in a conversation. And I have a video here of some uh, early prototypes that we've been doing of how this might work. And it's, uh, it's somewhat limited, this particular example, but it shows this working and it shows that these are, things are possible today. And uh, in Walls of the Wizard, it's a simulation experience I mentioned already where you are in this magical tower and there's a, there's a skull uh, character there that helps you do things in the world. And that's what you'll see here. And this is driven by a gener generative AI model and taking these new types of data and pushing it in there. Well, interested. But in any case, so what the demo showed was this, oh, the mic is here. What this demo showed was this character talking to you with low latency uh, interaction. So it feels like a more natural discussion. You can say things to him and he understands it. And you can point at things and say, hey, what's this? Or you can t hold two things and say, what am I holding? He understands you're holding something. He understands where you're looking. He understands how close to you, close to him he is. He understands um, the different objects and the layout of the world itself. And he gets things like, you know, are you hesitant? Are you, what, how, how is your body moving? Are you crouching? What are you doing? And the, the interesting part about that is, you know, when I say any single thing about what I'm describing here, you, you sort of you draw blanks and like, okay, but what does that matter when you're interacting? Yeah, and that's, that's actually true. But once you start putting all of that into, into the world, into the AI, that's when he starts, yeah, suddenly he mentions, like, maybe you shouldn't be crouching when you're talking to me, or, or um, yeah, you know, that thing in your right hand, he, he might mention that um, beforehand without you ever prompting that. It starts feeling more natural and starts feeling more like you're talking to an actual being that understands you and sees you there. And that's a, a huge, um, huge factor in making a person feel comfortable and engaged in a conversation. And so, yeah, moving on from that, the other part here is like, this is not something that VR and AR is doing alone. We've been moving in this direction in the whole computing industry for a long time. You know, nobody was working on VR and AR technically for a long time, and yet all of the different components of that suddenly were in place for someone like Paul Merlucky to put it all together into a package and found Oculus. That's not a coincidence. It's because we are pushing technology in a certain way to make it more accessible, the interface is more powerful, and 
everything virtualized, whether it's us that's becoming more virtualized with, or the world around us with things like maps and um, wearable technologies and everything. So, so all of this is sort of creating a virtual version of everything. And it's all becoming interconnected. And VR and AR is just the ultimate embodiment of that. It's the ultimate, it's the, it's the computing platform that natively integrates that as its primary method of interaction. We can't get any, any more natural interfaces than that. That is how we evolve to interact. And once we have those technologies in a sufficiently packaged and neat form, it starts to become a magical power rather than a device that we interact with. And I think, to me, that's like the final computing platform. You know, we've seen this term used, but that's, that's to me what this, um, this theoretically is. It's the final computing platform isn't a computer at all. It's just these raw and unabstracted magical powers to do things, as well as the interface that can enable these sort of high technology experiences with characters or worlds that feel indistinguishable from reality. Not just in the way they look, but in the way they act. And I think that's the most important part, that they act like it's real. So that is the um, end of this um, talk, and I'd be happy to take any questions you might have. Interesting. And um, my question would be in terms of storytelling. How do you think we game developers can like use this technology without like uh, exhausting our players because we need to like uh, jump and duck and move uh, our bodies around in crazy ways? Well, I think you know the the thing is we, we don't have to move that much when we're interacting. Mm -hmm. Like right now, it's just we could be having a conversation sit, sitting down and. In reality, like when all of these things are working together, that becomes super engaging. It becomes just, you are engulfed in a conversation. And you might remember a conversation with a person seated, seated at a table longer than any game you've ever played. <laughs> because it's so much more engaging. And a part of that is all of the interaction, all of the data that's moving between you and, and the person you're talking to. Okay, yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs>